very ominous title, but it's, uh, it's, uh, and it's not uh, a, a sort of a visionary talk. It's just three, uh, three brief items, and one of those items you should already be um, familiar with. Um, stuff that I've been thinking about. Um, I think the first one I haven't uh, uh, talked about before. So, um, in container runtimes, is it okay if I stand here? Uh, in container runtimes, uh, we have this issue of using loop devices a lot. And uh, in loop devices, you can change the media that is attached to them, like images and so on. So, you could be trying to mount a loop device image a loop device, and uh, while you're doing so, uh, the image changes, and there is no easy way to detect this. It was a long-standing problem for quite a while, and uh, then uh, Christoph came up with this idea of using disk sequence numbers, or introducing the concept of a disk sequence number. So all disk devices have a monotonically increasing sequence number, 64-bit integer, which can be used to detect media changes. Also goes for USB sticks that you unplug and uh, replug <coughs> into your computer again. And uh, these disk devices can be queried using the block gate disk sec uh, IOCTL. And so user space uh, has a way of finding out when uh, a media has changed or the media attached to a loop device, for example, has changed and nowadays uh, systemd will in addition to a bunch of other stuff such as like uh, slash diff slash disk slash uh, by uuid uh, it will also have by disk sec uh, so you can reference uh, disk devices uh, through uh, these sim links by their disk sequence number so this already eliminates a bunch of races um, but not uh, all of them so as far as i understand so you could, for example, still try to specify a block device or in the new mount API, you could try to set the by fsconfig the source property and the source property would be a string slash def sda1 or whatever, uh, or def loop1, and uh, that loop device gets resolved. Uh, you're mounting it, but in between the media attached to that loop device has changed, so you'd be mounting the wrong uh, thing. And this is a worry for uh, unprivileged uh, doing unprivileged mounts, for example, or doing unprivileged mounts for in lieu of a container. And so the idea that I uh, had pitched off list to, um, to Christoph before was to introduce a new generic uh, property uh, in the new mount API, which I called a working title source disk sequence number to source disk seek. So what you could do in addition to the source property, you could also specify, query the disk sequence number for the specific device that you want to mount. You set it uh, with the new mount API and once the file system actually comes to looking up the block device that is supposed to be mounted, it would be able to detect, hey, this is no longer the block device that we actually care about. The disk sequence number has changed, uh, go away. The I find this to be fairly uncontroversial, but I wanted this uh, input from uh, all of you. There is some uh, work associated with this because I think it would mean that most file systems that are uh, block-backed, which aren't, haven't been ported to the new mount API, would have to be ported uh, to the new mount API for this uh, to work. Uh, I'm fine with doing this work, I don't, I don't mind. I think there is also probably a lot of patches that already exist in this area. Uh, and so then once this is done, we would need a helper in, in the block layer that, uh, that would be able to compare disk sequence numbers stored in the, in the block device, and that's about it. So for old file systems, couldn't you also do an FCNTL, which would mean you could query this through either source? And that would mean they wouldn't need porting to the new, I mean, okay, I know everything needs porting, but it's- Sorry, I have really bad hearing, James. I Use an, uh, a file system control instead of, uh, as well as the FS control. And what would the file system control do exactly? Uh, basically, some sort of thing to either query the disk sequence and you have to compare, or you could actually set it as a, you do the F, uh, you do a control first, then you do the mount, and it fails if it doesn't match something like that. Even with the old mount API, you mean? Yeah. It, it would probably work, but I mean. I mean, 
Uh, there have been one specific file system that we know about. Who else needs to be moved to the new mount API? I haven't looked, to be honest. Uh, I just assumed that not all of them have been converted. Yeah, I'm going to do it next week, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I know I we haven't. I it's it's not a it's not a problem. Like if you don't have time to work on this, I can probably carve out some time and, and, and do this. So. No, I've I've had requests from other people, and like the Fedora guys are switching their stuff to use the new Mountain API. And they're like, oh, but our file system is also like, no, my bad. So I'll get it done. I promise. But if like, I mean, I'll just go look and see because if it's relatively straightforward, and let's just convert everybody as quickly as possible and see. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, any more questions on that? Okay, cool. So, and the other thing you've probably already, uh, oh, sorry. Now I'm suddenly regretting inviting you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to mention that, of course, it's great if uh, uh, during mount we check the disk sec, but at least in theory, it would probably be wise to also check that while the thing is mounted, right? Like, so if you have a ButterFS uh, file system mounted and some day later, the media change changes. Ideally, ButterFS, um, uh, like the disk sec changes, ideally ButterFS would just say, okay, the file system is now invalidated in some way. So it's, it's, I think it's important, like and most interesting to have that during the actual mount thing, but actually probably to perfectly close the, the security thing would have to. Yeah, there has been discussion recently about how it would be really nice, and I think Christoph has actually sent patches now that I think of it, so that the block layer can inform the file system when media has been ejected so that we can just simply shut the file system down completely, right? So, because um, I think the problem is it's not just that, you know, the media switches out from under you, we want to shut it down as soon as the old media is removed, right? And I don't even care about what happens when you insert the new media. I want the file system gone when it's ejected. Yeah. But we do this anyway. If you eject a block device that goes down to being a zero size device, when we rescan it, it comes back as a different device. Now, file systems don't like this sudden change, but it does mean we can't corrupt the device. Right, yeah, I think the issue is because the file system isn't informed, we essentially have to check all the time or people report the kernel crashes because the media was ejected. The file system you know, didn't know that the media had been ejected and it gets an error or dereferences a pointer that was freed behind the file system's back when the, when the media was ejected. So yeah, that, this is why we want a callback as opposed to it just happening and expecting that we will deal with it. Um, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so the uh, other thing, I don't know how many uh, have uh, seen this patch set or have uh, followed this patch set. Um, the originating, uh, well, the inspiring uh, cause for this uh, was the ability to uh, call it upgrading mounts or replacing mounts. And uh, we thought about several ways of doing this. Um, one of the very tricky requirements of this work is that it needs to work with mount propagation. Because the way systems are set up, well, sorry, the way system uh, view services are usually used on most modern system is that you have propagation set up between the system services and the host system. And uh, if you want to change a mount across all services, then you need to be able to somehow update that mount on all services. And the only way this can work in the current, uh, yeah, with the current uh, VFS layout is the with mount propagation. And um, the problem uh, is if you if you update for example, slash user, you put a first mount on slash user, it propagates into all the services, all the services see a new updated user. If you do this a second time, you have the problem that you now have a mount uh, beneath that mount. If you do it another time, then you have another mount on top of it and so on. So you have an endless stack of mounts. And if you think about running a thousand services and if you upgraded it five times, then each of those services has a stack of five separate mounts in the kernel that are duplicated. 
Um, if you unmount it first and then mount again, you have the problem that you expose the underlying mount point in between, between so the service might see uh, old um, data. So uh, we try to think about ways on how to achieve this. And the uh, easiest way implementation-wise um, so that you don't run into uh, additional mount complexities was by allowing to mount a mount beneath uh, another mount. And it is really not very, uh, that there's really not much more um, to it. Um, so the way that we do it, I, I think I briefly talked about this yesterday, is if you have an FD open to a specific file, in this case a mount point, um, you would have a dentry and a mount, and uh, that path usually doesn't change, but if you go into the mount code, you call a function called lock mount, which acquires and drops namespace lock, and then walks up the mount stack. So if you have something mounted on top of that specific mount point, so let's say slash op, and on top of slash op you have a new slash temp mount, and on top of it you have a slash source mount, and you have a file descriptor to the slash op mount, what the kernel does is lock mount, oh, okay, there's something mounted on slash op, uh, this is slash temp, now I'm at the slash temp mount, acquiring the lock again, walking up, getting the slash SRD mount, and that's my topmost mount, okay, uh, I'm done. And then namespace lock is held, you can't overmount anymore, and then you've stacked a new mount uh, on top of this mount. Correct me if I'm, um, if I'm wrong. So what this just does is uh, it walks up to the topmost mount, and then it shoves a new mount under the uh, topmost mount. So at that point, uh, you can unmount the topmost mount, and you reveal the underlying um, mount point. Um, there are two, um, it's basically an, uh, a way to replace mounts without actually replacing the mounts because there are several um, complexities involved in this. So if you really were to uh, replace uh, a mount, you'd run into issues that uh, one of the mounts could have child mounts mounted on dentries of its parent mount. And uh, if you shove a new mount, want to replace that mount, uh, the child mounts are not guaranteed to have mount points on that new mount that you're trying to shove under anymore. So that really doesn't work. The other thing is if you call uh, view mount uh, afterwards, you are holding potentially holding names, namespace lock for a very long time because of mount propagation. You first propagate a bunch of mounts and then you also view mount propagate again. So it's really not nice to, to do it this way. With the uh, ability to shove a mount beneath an existing mount, you just need to do the mount propagation once and then it's up to user space to upgrade to the new mount by calling uh, view mount and then uh, mount propagation will uh, reveal this. There is a, oh, Ted, go ahead. Yeah, um, how does this interact with uh, OverlayFS? Uh, OverlayFS is just, there shouldn't be a problem. OverlayFS is just, uh, so when OverlayFS is mounted, it clones the underlying mounts of the lower layer, so it's a private mount stack. They don't appear anywhere, and the overlay of mount is just a single separate mount, so it's just a regular mount point. It shouldn't be oh, uh, a problem. Right. So you would shove another overlay FS mount on top of another overlay FS mount, unmount it, and then you update to the underlying overlay FS mount. So this shouldn't be a problem. The more intricate parts are, and if I, maybe I can briefly illustrate this. This is just a kernel that has these patches, but I want to illustrate what uh, one of the problems with mount propagation is. Thank you. So you can see, uh, you can see there is a single opt mount now. If I mount on top of this opt mount, let's say 10 times, How many mounts do we have? We 
have like thousands or uh, it's really you can't if you type find mount it's going to be very ugly <laughs> so the the problem really is that uh, if you have a situation where the parent mount and the child mount that is mounted on top of the parent mount are in the same peer group then they propagate to each other which means if you propagate a new mount you first of all mount it uh, so the way this internally works in a, a tetra recursive mount is you first propagate so you mount the mount on top of the slash opt mount copy and then you do the actual source mount mounting beneath the mount that you just propagated so then you have a mount stack so and you can see this grows almost exponentially like the more mount points you have the, the more you uh, the more mounts you are creating due to uh, mount propagation. I, I'm, I'm really not sure if these semantics were intended or if they just uh, ended up there by accident, but I wanted to avoid this with the uh, patch that I'm working on. Would it make more sense to have a uh, just a swapped mount? Here's a mount, swap it for that one. Um, yeah, I, I thought about this. This is like the replace mount thing, but then you have to have certain restrictions. This is what I tried to say um, earlier. This way, by mounting a move a mount, a moving a mount beneath another one, the mount that you're uh, mounting beneath can have child mounts, and uh, it doesn't really matter. But if you replace a mount, then the mount that you are updating, and so the mount that you're replacing, the mount that you're trying to replace with, needs to be the same mount, so that all of the child mounts are guaranteed to have mount points on the new mount. So when you said it's the top mount, it's not necessarily the top most mount, because there may be yet more mounts on top of it. Sorry? Top is uh, archaeological top, not child top. I understand. <laughs> so you can have a slash opt mount, and on that slash opt mount, like let's say you have slash A, slash B, slash C. You have uh, slash A is your mount that is mounted on top of the uterus file system, and then on slash B, you have a child mount mounted. So on slash A, slash B, there is another mount. If I now take slash D and want to shove it, uh, replace it, so to speak, the slash A, B, C, slash A mount, the mount that is mounted on top slash B doesn't have a mount point on the new mount anymore. So I would need to get rid of it. And that is potentially problematic if you don't want to, to do that. You want to, for example, wait until you have um, unmounted specific child mounts before you actually upgrade to the new mount. The top and beneath are referring to a single directory inode. They stack on a single directory inode and the child's are children directory or a descendant directory. So this mechanism is just also a little more flexible. Like the replace, uh, the replace logic would uh, require you—you uh, you always want to replace that mount, but sometimes you might just want to mount it beneath, let the service do its work, and then unmount it, upgrade to the new mount. It, it just sounds—it it just sounds like there are going to be problems somewhere because you're changing the middle of the mount tree. This. Isn't it? <laughs> you mount you s <laughs> Yeah, but you shove some f when you say you've mounted beneath. So this is like a concept that exists today. Like I can uh, illustrate this. For example, if you have mount propagation, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to? It should be automatically. Uh. Yeah. Here you have a temp mount mounted. Uh, you can you hold it for a second? Here you have a temp mount mounted on an opt mount in that mount namespace. That mount namespace, well, 
the root of that mount namespace slash uh, is a slave mount to the host mount namespace. So here you have an opt mount. Here you can see that you have the opt mount, which is now the parent mount of the temp mount that has been mounted here before. So the mount is beneath that mount. That already exists. Yes, but there can be things that assume they know the look at in the say proc uh, pid ft and the path changes because now you've got. I mean, it sounds like a very. I wouldn't know why this would be a problem because, as I said, this this can happen already today. Like you, they would need to be dealing with this already. Mounts can appear beneath your current mount. Yeah. A couple of kernels ago, it would be even worse because you would have shadow mounts. So then, in this case, in this case, you would have. Uh, this would look differently. Uh, think about this second opt mount being moved one layer to the right, and it, these two mounts would shadow each other. And uh, you would n need to figure out that the lowest mount in this case is the one whose contents you're seeing. So, you know what I'm saying? I think so. In the mount hash table, <laughs> in the mount hash table, you insert yeah. you insert based on uh, parent and uh, denfi, right? And then you look up uh, the child mounts of this specific uh, parent mount, and uh, you can have, you still can have today. Al pointed this out to me in very specific, I would say, uh, pathological scenarios. Um, you can have uh, a sequence of mounts that shadow each other, so they are mounted on the same denfi at the same parent. It's not unique, and uh, tucked mounts were a way, or tucked mounts in this case, mounting beneath was a way to get rid of this problem by having a clear parent-child relationship. You could, you always will have a clear child-parent relationship in this scenario. And by the way, what I showed you before, this uh, slash opt mount propagation problem in the same namespace is exactly the same thing. You're tucking mounts beneath the other one. So mount propagation had, if this is a problem, that ship has sailed 10 years ago. Or the, uh, or the book already exists, one of the two. Yeah. So anyway. the, the thing is, um, I wanted to avoid this problem. I think so you've got a comment from Al. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, if I may, uh, the pathological case is indeed pathological. And uh, it's not uh, a good thing to have. Uh, but... Uh, this uh, slide mount under the one we are going to replace uh, does not uh, address uh, another problem. If you have uh, something mounted on subdirectors of that thing, uh, th that won't get migrated on, on your sequence. Uh, okay, you, you, you've managed to slide uh, replacement under user. Say you've had something on user local. Now you are trying, you have new user under the old one and uh, user local mounted on a uh, uh, subdirectory local in, that file, in the old file system. Now you want to complete the transition. You want to get rid of old user. Uh, so you unmount it. If you do laser unmount, fine, that will work and that will expose the new one. But user local is gone. If you do non lazy, um, then uh, it will just say busy. That's you might try to move uh, uh, user local to uh, corresponding location on uh, replacement file system, but uh, I don't think that uh, you want that to happen uh, automatically by uh, by your uh, variant of uh, mount call and uh, that uh, had, and it's not convenient uh, to do with your setup. 
I mean, uh, you don't, well, you can't set it up before. The natural way to do it would be to migrate somehow uh, user local to corresponding location on the new one, then slide the whole thing under old user and then drop, lazy drop uh, old user from, from that thing. But uh, I, I mean, uh, the problem I have with that is uh, basically usability of that for user and how inconvenient would it be to do if uh, the thing you are replacing has something mounted on its subdirectories, not on its root. Yeah, that's on the, subdirectories. That, that, yeah. That's the, the point that I was trying to make uh, um, to uh, David before that I don't think so. Basically, what I would say in this case, you just want a lazy U mount um, if you want to upgrade to the underlying uh, to the underlying mount point. Uh, and if you have to, sorry, go on. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so, but, but basically, my answer is I don't see this as a I don't see this as a, a problem. This is fine. But but if you do that, um, then you still have that window where user local is not visible. Yeah, if you have sub mounts, so ideally you just replace uh, you pr replace single mounts. I think replacing full mount trees unsolved problem. Might be doable. It might be doable, but I don't know if you really want to go down that route. Uh, well, uh, you mount the new, start with mount and the new one somewhere uh, reachable for you. Then uh, recursively bind um, the subtrace mounted on the old one on the corresponding positions on the new. Then slide the entire thing under the old you are replacing and uh, laser and mount what you've got there. But you still yeah. have the window of opportunity where... No, you don't. No. Don't you? No. You, you start with... Okay. Uh, you start with, say, mounting new replacement for user yeah. on uh, some place. Fine. Um, now you uh, bind uh, user local on replacement user local. And do the same for other file system mounted on, on top of user. User is and everything mounted on it is not disrupted at all. Yeah, yeah, it stays I, as is. I, okay. Then you slide the entire thing under user. You move it under, you move it beneath the user. And then you uh, lazy unmount user. I missed the bit. The, uh, lazy unmount is the key. Here. Okay. Yeah, so uh, that would be possible with the, if I understand correctly, this would be possible in the scheme that I have here. This is perfectly fine. And currently we have uh, we have a limitation. You could even do it, I, I'm not sure because I haven't ex thought in detail about this, but I think you could even do it with detached mounts. Currently you can't uh, put mounts on anonymous mounts, additional mounts on anonymous mounts. So you couldn't say, Open tree clone, and then use another detached mount and mount it on a subdirectory of that detached mount that currently doesn't work because the check mount check fails. And there might be some specific reasons to it. Please uh, let me in if that's the case. But if this is not uh, this is not an inherent problem, then you could even disassemble it. Uh, you could even assemble it without having it visible in the file system at all at first. Mm, there is a bit of a problem with that. One, uh, what if uh, you uh, mount, if, if you have detached tree and you mount something right on top of its root and then you slide that stack of two file, of two mounts, one on top of root, on top of root of the, another, slide, try to slide it uh, beneath something. Far as I can tell, uh, the code you've posted uh, will end up was precisely that pathological case. The 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 shadow mounts, yes. So the new yes. the shoe, new version that I posted, what I'm doing is uh, once I've acquired uh, namespace lock in uh, can. Okay, I will need to check it. Okay, I hadn't so, seen it. Sorry. Uh, I, no, no, no worries at all. Like I have path over mounted, 
uh, which is a, an, a lookup mount under RCU lock, and if it detects that something has been mounted on the from uh, code, mm -hmm. uh, it rejects the mount. It says, go away. Uh, your source has been overmounted in the meantime. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's fine. Like, this should be such a rare occasion that I, it, it, we could probably also try and make it so that it walks up to the topmost mount for the, uh, for the source mount, but I'm not sure if that's actually the case. Like, how often will you end up in a scenario where your source mount gets suddenly Problem not. overmounted? Problem not. Okay, uh, that's probably be best taken to email and RC back. So Taking a bunch of time already. So one thing that I tried to, to block with this, Amir, can I trouble you once more? I thank you so much. Um, is the, the, the case that I showed where you have this mount explosion thingy because of mount propagation. Um, because um, that actually, uh, thanks to Al, that I thought about this a bit deeper, and uh, if you could check this, it would be quite interesting. Um, if the, the parent mount that you're mounting on top and the mount uh, that you're mounting beneath are in the same peer group, so they propagate to it, the parent propagates to the child mount on top, then we refuse to move a mount beneath exactly to avoid this mount mm -hmm. explosion thingy that we have for uh, the current case. So what I mean is... Might be, but frankly, it's uh, it sounds like uh, doctor it hurts when I do it. Uh, it sounds like what? Doctor, it hurts when I do it. <laughs> With canonical answer, don't do it then. Yeah, but, but it's really, the, the thing is like people, yeah, I know, but I find it really weird when you have, when you request mount on top of something, currently the current semantics is mount on top of something, and then instead of one mount, you get two. And it, it's completely meaningless, in my opinion, to have first propagate a copy of the source mount on top of it, then n take the source mount, mount it on top of the target mount, and then remount the mount that you just propagated on top of the mount that you just mount. It's, it's, to me, this sounds Actually, like... Actually, uh, quite often, the use of bind mount directly on, on top of itself is this. It's followed by and make it private. Precisely to get it out of the uh, overpropagation insanity. To get yeah. yourself a room where you can work. Yeah, so the the only thing that I really changed is when the parent propagates to the the parent propagates to the uh, to the child mount. Uh, is that uh, you get Einwald. That's literally all, which is a friendly reminder mm -hmm. for the user, make the mount that you're trying to mount beneath private. I, my thing is, why should we repeat the same complexities that we already have in the mount propagation code? Yeah, consistency maybe, but anyway. Uh, I'm not... Uh, okay. I have no strong preferences. At the moment, I'll need to think about it. Okay, yes, yeah, so, uh, that sounds awesome. Uh, uh, th what I wanted to say here, for example, th the way mount propagation works is also a pain. <laughs> so if you propagate a mount, um, it's the mount that you're trying to propagate needs to be a subdirectory. The new mount point needs to be a subdirectory of the root of the mount that you're trying to propagate to. I know this is really a mouthful, but uh, for example, here the SRV uh, subdirectory isn't the SRV entry is in the subdirectory of the op entry, so in this case, you are able to, to mount beneath even though the parent propagates to the child because the uh, slash SRV mount wouldn't be propagated on top of the op mount before you actually mount on top of the op mount. I'm really sorry. Okay, uh, one thing we'll definitely need to remember is that uh, no way uh, that thing can go in without uh, documentation because I trying to uh, reconstruct it by the code will be unbearably hard. I have, um, so I, 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 I cheat you not, uh, sorry. I, um, no, no joke, but uh, I have a file that is uh, 1,600 uh, lines long that uh, explains all of the corner cases for myself. Uh, the comment message is uh, extremely long, and I've added comments to all of the uh, helpers, and specifically the 
parent doesn't propagate to child and parent doesn't propagate to the source mount that you're trying to mount uh, under. Uh, also has a long comment uh, trying to explain uh, why uh, that is blocked. And yes, I also want to have documentation for move mount, but I have to say uh, someone had man pages for certain system calls, but uh, they have not made it in yet. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Useful. Uh, don't try to filter absent as it takes too much time. Sorry, what? When you are posting your uh, notes of that sort, uh, don't uh, try to filter out obscenities. In my experience, it takes way too much time. <laughs> Nothing gets done. <laughs> okay, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, but uh, this is a this is a general problem for the uh, for the mount API, to be honest, because when we did, yes. we, we have. Um, I've been a strong proponent of it in the sense that I tried to be uh, try to push this into various user space projects. We have now util Linux completely converted mm -hmm. to the new mount API. Uh, also um, surfaced some smaller bugs. Systemd uses the new mount API now almost uh, exclusively. And the biggest problem is while the mount set other system call that I added is extensively documented, uh, open tree, move mount, uh, FS mount, FS open, and FS config aren't really documented. So I spend a lot of time uh, explaining Sorry. to people how it works. No, it's not, it's not uh, your fault. In large part, it is. <laughs> yeah, they just need to be. They just need to be. They just need to be. Uh, once we have that merged, uh, that'll be a good thing. And uh, I. Uh, uh, one of the nicest features that we have uh, and that he's going to talk about tomorrow is the ability to actually cleanly mount into mount namespaces and something which, for example, even though I've uh, worked a lot with the new mount API, only figured out a couple of months ago as like, this actually works. <laughs> um, so uh, that's pretty good. I think it, this opens up a lot of possibilities uh, for us that are quite awesome. Um, and I didn't get to my third point, but it's also uh, not that important, to be honest. Oh, right. <laughs>